Lake Placid in the Adirondack Mountains in upstate New York. Twice an Olympic venue. In February 2012, it held the FIBT World Championships for bobsleigh and skeleton. And now, less than a year later, we return. There's a little bit of snow on the ground as we get ready for the start of the two-man bobsleigh World Cup season. Hello everybody, I'm Martin Haven, alongside me is a man who knows plenty about two-man, four-man and this Lake Placid track, US athlete Kurt Tomasiewicz. Curtis, great for the US program to be starting back at home. Yeah, definitely. This is a season that will definitely favor us as far as the schedule goes. Uh, you know, starting in North America and especially on this track, the Americans are really looking forward to this. Well, this is a tough track for any non-US athlete to come to. It's tough enough for you guys, but it has a reputation, Lake Placid. It's been a really difficult track to get the best of. Yeah, it does. Uh, this track isn't the fastest in the world. We're not going to hit really high top speeds. Um, the length is, you know, 1,455 meters, but it's just jam-packed with curves, 20 curves total. Uh, the start is, is pretty average start. It's not one of the steepest. It's not one of the flattest. And the first three curves are somewhat... Um, mediocre. Nothing really dangerous comes through these first three curves. But once you get through this third curve, this is where the action starts. Curve four, then curve five, six, seven. It all comes so fast that there's not much time for a driver to, to collect himself. You know, he has to, to continue to, to build from one curve to the other and keep it going the entire time. This is the big curve. This is curve shady, a huge 180 degree right hand curve, and it comes into the labyrinth. Curve 11. 12 could give some drivers a little bit of a hiccup. And out of 14, we finally have the chicane where a driver might be able to breathe once or twice before he comes into the heart. Curve 17, a big left-hand curve. 18, a little right-hand curve, but could cause some problems as well. Curves 19 and 20 are both uphill, where if you make a mistake, tap a wall in there, that can really cost you a lot of time. We can see from the graphic, the track record dates back a long, long while. 2003, Pierre Ludus, now of course coaching, and Julio Zardo, his then brake man, setting the start and the downtime record. It's plus two and a bit, minus two and a bit. And the temperature is starting to drop now. What is it now? Five after one uh, Eastern time. And there you can see the man who you'll be breaking tomorrow. Steve Holcomb starts number one here in the USA one sled. And of course, it's the first race of the season. Of course, you're on home ice. You've had a little bit of training preseason here. But is there that kind of first night nerves, do you think? I mean, you know, it is the first competitive slide of the year. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was talking with Holcomb last night, and he was saying that he was uh, kind of hoping for a little bit of that nervousness because we've been here training on this track for three, four, five weeks now uh, without that international competition. So he's hoping for that pre-race jitter to really get him into the race mode that usually comes with every other race. Of course, the races you have done are almost more important because they're against your own teammates looking for positions on sleds. Steve Holcomb starts number one ahead of Canada's number one driver, Lyndon Rush. Going to be a great battle there. And what about Max Arndt? Edwin van Kalka returns for the Netherlands. He will start number four. And of course, you've got to look at Alexander Zubkov, new boy Francesco Friedrich for Germany. There's a big field here as well some 27 sleds three or four rookies we got some rookie brake men we got some first time world cup starters as well okay, here we go. and there's a couple of the nations the particularly looking there at the the places like switzerland that have not one. got their regular stars on board so all sorts of changes being run so here we go we are ready for the start of the world cup bobsleigh season stripping down for action the stevens stephen holcomb and stephen langton usa number one in february it was a pretty starry time here on the lake placid track for the u.s driver stephen holcomb he's one of 27 sleds from 17 different nations ready to take on this first world cup race of the year and holcomb will have a lot of confidence from pre-season training you know, it doesn't seem like that long ago where you're we racing here for world championships, and that's where Steve Holt and Steve Langton really busted out a great start time. 5.10 this time. Uh, last year at the world championships, they were in the low five seconds, about a tenth behind right now. Uh, a, lot, a lot of that has to do with just the, the, the weather conditions. You mentioned it's a little over two degrees Celsius. A little bit colder would have provided a little bit faster ice, but we'll be able to tell that with the next few sleds that come down. Well, we're expecting Steve to give us an object lesson in using the right line down this Lake Placid track. Through Shady he goes. Looked like a great exit there as well, and that's one of the key points for finding the speed. Benham's bend as well into the chicane. Drives that chicane very nicely, straight through there. That's a very difficult thing to do. 
so difficult not to touch the walls on at least one side, if not both sides, into the heart, and that momentum vital going uphill to the finish line. Langton pops out of the back there onto the brakes. 55-56. Brian Scheimer looked relatively happy with that. Now, it's hard to tell right now, but that looked like a great drive by Holcomb. You didn't see him banging off any of the walls. There were no big skids. Uh, of course, you know, being the first sled down the hill, it's, you know, it doesn't have a competition to compare to, but we'll definitely see as Linden Rush comes down next. The game to start so important in any competition. And just the same here in bobsled. Nice, neat load. Pretty smooth out of 12 and into 13. Right up into 14. And this is what I was talking about earlier, how he comes into the chicane. You know, this track isn't real straight right there. There's a couple little bends, but he finds the, the you know, threads the needle right through the eye there. It comes right through nice and straight. And he knew the line he was looking at. One tiny little steering movement, and he was straight through. Shot the chicane beautifully. The Maple Leaf flies for Canada 1. Lyndon Rush with Jesse Lumsden behind him. Lyndon, 31 years old now from Silver Lake, Alberta. Bronze medalist in the four-man in the Olympic Games in Calgary. He's a real contender for the gold medal in the World Championships here. 5'10 the start from Steve Holcomb, 5'16 from Lyndon. Yeah, so again, we weren't sure exactly where Steve Holcomb's start time stood, but now we can tell. 516 for Lyndon Rush. I'm betting he was hoping to, to be a little quicker off that start, a little closer to Holcomb. Double tap on the wall through three. That difference of six hundredths is now expanded to twelve hundredths. A little rocky there, trying to hold the speed late on both those corners, keeping the speed up on the banking. Came down a little hard off 12. You saw the tap right before curve 13. Now this is where Holcomb was straight through here. You can see Linden taking a couple of those taps. And he was two kilometers an hour down. Still 77.3 miles an hour. Coming up curve 19. Yeah, lost a lot of time. Already 48 hundredths of a second back. He's be well over a half second as soon as he crossed the finish line. 61 hundredths. Well, he's going to be shaking his head in disgust there. You saw a little bit of a raised eyebrow from Graham Richardson, the coach. Eurotech sled in second place at the moment. Don't expect him still to be second at the end of this run, though. And I'm not sure that he will think that's a second place run either. Sorry, you can see that, that slap just a little bit out of the curves as he comes through right here. Curve 9 into curve 10. Big shady. And he's nice and high right there. That allows him to, to kind of fall straight into curve 11. But again, this is where he took a couple taps to the chicane. Now, again, he's being compared to, to Steve Tried Holcomb, to which, you know, Steve Holcomb shot that very finished. almost perfectly. One, uh, so it was very difficult for Linden to keep up with that. Well, there is Linden. Jesse Lumsden, the CFL player with his helmet still on. And at the top of the track is Germany 2. This is Maximilian Arndt with Marco Hubenbecker, who's really pushed himself very strongly into the German breaking lineup. Max Arndt is 24 years old. Hubenbecker, definitely the tallest push athlete on the circuit. You know, he's well over 6'5", 6'6". Push a 5'22". You know, he likes to use those long levers in order to, to gain that momentum going, jumping into the sled. But uh, 5'22", quite a bit behind Steve Holcomb. Max Arndt spent a lot of time on World Cup podiums last year in both disciplines. He was a runner-up in the two-man and the four-man World Cup title races. So a really consistent slide. Yeah, you can never count out a German sled. Germany won two or three. It doesn't matter. They're always going to be in the mix for medals, podium finishes, always up there at the top. A couple of surprise retirements from the German program just pre-season has left them in a little bit of disarray. Shot that chicane pretty well. Pretty straight through there, 124.6 kilometers an hour, but still a little bit behind Holcomb, uh, just a little bit faster than Rush. Of course, everybody's going to go, well, you know, it is home track advantage, and Holcomb has had more runs down this track this season, but of course, Predominantly, the Germans have at least three tracks usually in a World Cup campaign that they know well. No other nation has that kind of advantage. So you take it where you can get it, right? Definitely. You know, uh, we've been on this track. The Americans have been practicing on this track for the last few weeks. Uh, Germany has been shifting around. They've been to a number of different tracks, hoping that that, uh, that variety of practice can help them do better here in Lake Placid. Uh, you can see him taking the tap out of curve three there. A little bit shaky coming through curve eight, nine, and into ten. Big shady curve. And here he comes out of curve 14. And again, he shot this chicane pretty well, but already at this point, he just didn't have a whole lot of speed. 
Well, Max Arndt, last year his first full World Cup campaign, really showing plenty of pace. And Edwin van Kalker, so it's just a little bit more uh, rejuvenation going on in the Dutch programme. Sibren Jansma, the giant behind him, formerly the tallest man on tour, but uh, yeah, I reckon Hubermecker might shave him a little bit for that. Uh, with Eurotech sleds and new sponsorship package as well for this season. They've got two sleds on World Cup Tour as well for the first time in a long while. Ivo Danilevic, the coach there, cleaning off the driver's handle. It wouldn't surprise me if either or both of the Dutch sleds are in the mix of the, the top six here as we get close to the end of the race later on today. Kind of the, the dark horses of this competition, maybe. Of course, everybody now, the World Cup is going through the motions exactly, but it is building up towards one specific point, and that maximum density of 5.13 getaways, a very good start, and that's something the Dutch have always been good with. Yeah, Sebring just an animal in the back of that sled. And all looking towards Sochi 2014. Six hundredths of a second off Steve Holcomb's lead. This is a really good run already from Edvin van Galke together this bottom half coming out of curve shady into the labyrinth this would be a key point for him right here second place run at the moment carried it a little high not too bad coming out out of curve 14 shooting the chicane you know it's again, it's not a straight track right there so it's very hard to keep the sled from bouncing off the walls it's the lowest speed we've seen but he kept it clean little tap there in the heart but second yes he is still a big ah, margin yeah. though six tenths from first to second there's a lot of room there for somebody else to drop in lots of somebody else's frankly yeah the, the key to that run right there was the start he would was able to compete with Holcomb through the first probably six seven eight curves and just try to hold that uh, that closeness as he went down well, he ties with Lyndon Rush at the bottom, 300s quicker than Rush at the top. You see big Sebrin pushing that sled from the back end, jumps in. It's not easy for a big guy that size to, to jump into a sled, but does it nice and smooth. Well, you know, you're sprinting over speed downhill on sheet ice. It's not easy for a guy of any size to jump into the back of a sled. Holcomb fastest, Van Kalka a couple of kilometers an hour away, but Danilevich likes that. Uh, Sebring closest to us, there's Edwin. He's pulled off some big results in two and four man over the years. Looks like he might be in for a bit of a season. And what about this guy? All right, Latvia's number one, undisputed king of Latvian bobsledding now, Oscars Melbardis. Came from the back handles as a brake man to drive. Dalmut Strieskin's behind him. This should be a start monster pairing as well. Most of the races last year, this pair had the fastest start on the hill. 5.10 was Holcomb's start. 5.02, wow, that's a fantastic start for those guys. I bet they would have wished they would have had that last year at the World Championships. Just 100th off the start record. That is a monster getaway. To beat guys like Holcomb by a tenth of a second is massive. He extended his lead now to 110. But again, driving isn't necessarily the strong part of this team. So they, they get off to a great start and they just try to hold that lead. We'll see if Mel Bardis can hold that lead. Now it's down to 500s with still half a track to go. It's not a track he knows well. If he gets to Europe and he gets starts like that, then he's going to be in the frame the whole time. Think back to a couple of seasons ago in Samaritz when he led after the first heat. Of course, this late start number helped him, but he's still building up that skill. Yeah, you can see that lead has now disappeared and he's a quarter of a second behind, but still definitely good enough to come across the line in second place. Wow. Well, we talked about uh, Rush and Van Kalka being six tenths back in second and lots of room for somebody else to jump in. Oscars Melbardis fills his boots, but still 0.45 behind. Good run from him, though. Yeah, when he gets more driving experience, there's definitely going to be a team that's going to be hard to, to mess with when Sochi comes around. Of course, one of the things the Latvians have is they do have the track that the Russians built at Segulda for the, for the USSR to train on. So they've got an ice track, they've got an ice house, they've got facilities to be doing pre-season training. Yeah, absolutely. When Sochi comes around, there's, there's no excuse for them, really. They've got everything set up, good equipment. Yeah, they definitely have that start. 
couple of real beasts yeah absolutely and here's another man who is not going to go down without a fight alexander zubkov for him more than anything else soshi 2014 will be the pinnacle of his career on the right hand side a new addition to the team pierre lude is there in the cap the coach and if he can't polish up zubkov's driving then there is no polishing to be done yeah, just when you think the, the Russians are already a favorite going into Sochi, you know, they add just another expert to, to help them get even better coming into the 2014 Olympics. Well, the base, yes, made Zubkov convert to driving in goggles. 5.14 start from Zubkov and Dmitry Chenenkov. Very smooth so far. Now, coming out of this curve three, you'll see most of the sleds take that tap on their left side of the sled. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That tap kind of sets him up for curve four. When you see them coming in sideways and kind of make it a double tap, that's when they're going to be scraping off time. Just a couple of exits there. Kept it on the wall, but not too long. Two tenths behind, still comfortably in second. Zubkov typically drives this track really well, but he's definitely had some bad luck. Or, uh, I say it's to his own fault, but, you know, he's had some trouble and been disqualified. Uh, being overweight and underweight a couple times, but uh, you know when he can put together a solid run with a solid start time, he's definitely going to be in the mix of the medals as well. He's drifted away to fifth position, 56-18, and actually the disqualification, that's a very valid point. In the World Championships in February, he got one run and was disqualified on a weight issue. Everybody else got at least two or three or four runs, so they've got more recent experience of the track. You're right, he did miss out on some some fast ice conditions here, so it's not uh, not real comfortable maybe on this smooth, fast ice on race day. Of course, he went on then to race all four heats in the four-man, but it's the experience of this different, the sports car of bobsled rather than the big race truck. Well, Zubkov's got plenty of ice miles, started in Luge, was successful in that before he moved on. There's Holke. Yay. <laughs> Big monitor down on the finish dog. He's liking what he's seeing. A little bit of schadenfreude. He don't really want to delight in anybody else's mistakes, but if they're going to make him, then yeah, we'll take that. That was definitely their reaction when they saw the Latvians come down and saw their start time, 5.02. Alexander Kazyanov with Max Belugin. This is Russia too. Don't forget, all top 10 finishes in the World Cup points last year go into a random draw for the start order here, 5.28. It's the slowest start we've seen so far. And that's perhaps an indication of the fact that the Russians don't have massive depth in their starting ability anymore. Well, what the Russians lack in start ability, they might pick up for the equipment. You know, they've put forth a lot of funding coming into the 2014 Olympics, and they bought a number of Singer sleds, you know, sleds that have proven to, to win medals for other countries. So these guys are, you know, should put together a pretty good run and hopefully make a, a run at the top ten. Well, they were so impressed with the Singer brothers work in Germany, they bought into the company, giving the Russians part-owned Singer, and they're also buying sleds from Vimmer, who are the other name to drop in bobsledding at the moment, particularly their formats. The Vimmer seems to be the one that is preferred by all their drivers. But even with the best equipment in the world, he's still off the push, he's still off the drive, and uh, Kazyanov just didn't have that great run right here. Well, again, Kazyanov in the top 10 in the overall World Cup rankings. A degree of that might be down to consistency. He's not really yet a full top 10 competitor on his day. He can be, but not always. Out of Shady, a little high on the exit, maybe. Yep, and you can see how he, he comes to the left side in between curve 10, 11, between Shady and 11. And you mostly want to be on the right side, so you can get into 11 nice and early. Comes out of curve 14 and again bangs off the, the chicane walls a couple times. To clear the track. The track is now clear from the finish. To start when you one. look at it straight ahead from, from the camera watching the sled come to you, you can see that what Holcomb did is possible. There is room to get a sled straight through. It just ain't easy. Yeah, it's, there's not much room at all coming through that chicane. Of course, if it was easy, I'd be doing it. <laughs> now, Germany 3, Francesco Friedrich having to step up late because Karl Angerer uh, announced his withdrawal from the German squad just a couple of weeks before the start of the season. His father died very unexpectedly. He said, I cannot leave home for six months with, uh, with what's going on here. I'm done. Uh, my career is finished, which is sad for him, but it, it also leaves the German coaches with a bit of a problem. 5.13 there, that's a decent start, but Friedrich, very inexperienced driver in World Cup terms. Yeah, he hasn't been here very often, um, but, you know, it doesn't matter. You're a driving experience. You can still push that sled fast, and that's what he did there, 5.13. That's a great start for him. 
Well, you won't be scared of this track. He grew up with the Altenburg track, so he knows a thing or two about Rufty Tufty tracks. Made his World Cup debut at Samaritz in January last year. Here he is, full World Cup start for the German team, just three races on. Very good through the chicane. See that black sled flying through there, didn't touch a wall. 124.6, the only man who's gone quicker, Stephen Holcomb. 0.45 behind, this is a top four slide at the moment. Third place, Christoph Langen likes that. Yeah, finally somebody was able to, to jump ahead of those uh, sleds that are about in fourth, fifth, and sixth place where we have only about 300 separating, let's see, 300 separating third place to sixth place. Now, I was talking down his chances as a very inexperienced World Cup rookie. Here he is in third as the top German sled so far. Yeah, the Germans are so deep. Like I mentioned earlier, when uh, Arndt was going down the track, they, you know, they could place you know, probably five in the top ten on almost any track because of their expertise and the variety of sl tracks that they practice on. Well, let's have a look at Christoph Langen's reaction. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't speak German, but I'm pretty sure that nobody can understand what he was just saying to himself no, right there. But, but you see the fists, he's still holding the D-rings, he's moving the body, doing the steering actions, he's trying to do it by remote control. Now then, Monaco, ninth start of our 27 sleds. This is Patrice Servelle, their veteran driver, Ellie Lefort. And behind in the blue hat, Bruno Mijon, 1998, four-man bronze medalist in the Olympic Games. Now this season will be interesting for Patrice. In the past couple of years, he's used Gata Stowe, he's used uh, Lascelles Brown as a, as a push athlete, but both, both of those guys are unavailable to him this year. Start time here, 540, well behind the pace. Three tenths behind at the, at the first 50 meters, and that's, that's only made things very difficult for Patrice to come into the mix. Lascelles Brown was a big uh, bonus, wasn't he? And Seb Cattuso as well, European Championship sprinter, uh, was a, a really good powerhouse on the back. He's missing that a little bit early before. Patristo's been around for a number of years, been on this track a number of times. A lot of experience. But just didn't have it at the start. 96 hundredths of a second back already. We've still got five curves to go. And he's behind Kazyanov of Russia as well. Next, 528 is the next slowest start. He's starting 1200s back, and the rule of thumb is that you'll be three times that margin down at the bottom. He's a long way off the lead, 5689. I think the moment Bruno Mijon saw the start numbers, he was expecting very similar at the bottom. Good speed, 124.6 is not bad at all. Oh. He's an experienced driver, but didn't look like a great slide. Yeah, it just wasn't put together for Patrice today. You see that little skid of the back end coming through curve three, or coming into curve three, coming out of curve three. Takes that natural tap, which isn't a bad thing, but coming out of the chicanes, just bouncing around. He well, calls second fastest, but Holcomb, it's another step up, isn't he? Yeah, Holcomb definitely drove the curve, the sections, uh, curve 11 through 14, that labyrinth. He drove that section really well, and that's where that speed shows up. The disdain with which Savelle surveyed the figures when he was handed them was all too obvious. Well, we've got a German in third place with Francesco Friedrich. What can Manny Mahata produce? Was that a stumble from the brakeman, Christian Poser? Jumps into the sled, you know, sometimes when you have that little hiccup there, you kind of put it into overdrive and you try to make up for it, and that doesn't always work. That starts on a 522, that's something he's going to, going, going to want to have back. Well, that was the same as Max Arndt, Germany 2. So Germany 1, Germany 2 on 22, Germany 3 at 513. 1900s of a second back already. But if anybody can bring this sled back, it's Manuel Mahata. During Monday's practice times, he had smoking runs. He was faster than anybody else on the track. Yeah. I remember when he arrived in Wissa at the beginning of the, the season two years ago as a rookie straight out of the Europa Cup and was on the podium both in two-man and four-man with a gold medal and a silver medal from his first ever World Cup weekend. That was, hello, I'm here, and he's still here. Yep, you're not going to find a better man to, to drive this German sled. 
Well, he's fourth, so we've got Francesco Friedrichs, the youngest of the drivers, in third, and a three-way tie for fourth place. Lyndon Rush, Edith van Kalke, and now Manny Mahata, all tied in fourth spot. Here's a start. Yeah, it did seem to stumble just a little bit. It wasn't really a, a trip or a slip, but he really went to the left side of the grooves as he's pushing that sled, and I'm not exactly sure what had happened. Maybe his balance was off just a little bit. He could have had a little slip of his hand. Well, the Movember thing is uh, catching on a lot among a lot of the U.S. and Canadian athletes, and Manny Mahata, he's got a, a good Edwardian handlebar with moustache and sideburns combination going on as well. Take a look at that face fungus. A little bit of the Orange County chopper showing up here in Lake Placid. Yeah, you're right, actually. He does look like Paul. Steve Holcomb is our comfortable race leader. 10 of 27 sleds in this bumper field in the season opener. We have lots more action to come. No snowball throwing. Every snowball fight in history has ended badly if there is snow in the track it is an uneven field of play so do not throw snowballs it's a pretty simple cut and dry rule here at the track do not throw snowballs we're going to have nick simone and chris the next three sliders still with 17 sleds yet to come steve holcomb still with the time to beat a 55 5 6. BT Bob and Skeleton World Cup here in Lake Placid. And to review the schedule for the rest of the day after this heat. We're scheduled for a 2.15 start for the women's third run of the skeleton competition. And then at 3 o'clock, this race will have its second run, the top 20 in this Lake Placid, the venue for the 1932 and 1980 Winter Games. Well, that track is still buried, the 1980 track in the hillside alongside us. And, of course, the Miracle on Ice, that museum down there in the heart of Lake Placid itself. Lots of fans on hand watching the first race of the Bobsleigh World Championships for men. Look at the gap first to second, but from Oscars Melbardis in second down to eighth place, just two tenths of a second covering seven sleds. But they're all nearly half a second and more behind Stephen Holcomb. Sitting alongside me is Kurt Tomasevich. Kurt, Steve Holcomb with just a blinding opening run to the season. He's keeping up from, from where he left off in February. Yeah, and that's just it. It's, you know, he built uh, that confidence from last year, the way we ended you know, winning two world championships and even a third world championship if you count the, the team race. Uh, just a lot of confidence on this track, and this is where he spends most of his time. Well, here is the USA 2 sled, Nick Cunningham, and just tribal behind him. Cunningham performing very well in selection races as well. Since he's got a lot of motivation, a lot. He and Corey Butner really revved up to kind of try and rock the establishment a bit here. Yeah, if you have anybody to compare to, you know, who better to compare yourself to than Holcomb? That's what they've been doing for the last few weeks. Andreas in the back of that sled, an incredibly strong athlete. Saw him clean 180 kilos just yesterday, or just the other day. 518, not too bad for them. That's a good getaway. Nick has hundreds of trips down this track. Takes that easy tap out of curve three, sets him up nice, in, nice into curve four, five, six. Well, his preseason training was interrupted, wasn't it, by the hurricane, and suddenly uh, a lot of guys here had to get back on duty to go down and help those that were in trouble down in the south of the state. 
Yeah, Nick took a couple days and went down to New York, helped some people. As part of the National Guard, he felt that that was his duty. But uh, it doesn't look like he missed too much coming back onto the track. 124.9 kilometers an hour. I believe that's the second fastest yep. so far, right behind Holcomb. Yeah, only one man quicker than Steve Holcomb. You say sleds. Bodine sled still works really well through the air. 56 0 oh, six. Great run for Nick, yeah. Wow. You know, he was seventh off, excuse me, his rank was seventh at the start, but slowly worked his way up, went to third, it worked his way up into third place, excuse me. So that was a, just a great demonstration of driving all the way through. You know, Definitely happy. Nothing healthier for a team than to have a superstar that everybody else is desperately trying to catch because it just raises everyone's game. Holcomb doesn't want to be caught, and these two guys just want to get right to him. Yep, absolutely. You can see, Nick, this is the only track he's been driving on this year so far. And you can tell, coming through the labyrinth, right before they pick up that speed trap, 124.9 kilometers an hour. That's really fast for this, this section. And still... A couple of little things he could iron out, but there's a big smile on his face, and rightly so. Well, next up is our Italian representative, Simone Batazzo and Francesco Costa. Costa, the young man on the back of this Italian sled. Two former Italian Olympians, or two former Olympians, one from Italy, one from Austria, doing the coaching. Batazzo had a pretty torrid start to last season, tore a hamstring early on. Crashed straight through the finish area at La Plain in the race there as well. It was Every time he got up, somebody kicked him back down again. Yeah, nothing seemed to go right for Bertazzo last year. Just a, a string of bad luck. Uh, that's the good thing about, you know, just the new season. The, ath the athletes that did well want to continue that. They want to build off that confidence that they had from the year before. The athletes that didn't do well the previous year, they're, you know, they're hungry to do well this year. The drawbacks for Italians is that unexpectedly during the month, the track at Cesana, the host of the 2006 Winter Olympic Games, closed its doors. Now, Cortina, the older track, has been trying to get back into World Cup racing, and that may yet happen, so they still have a track on which to train, but uh, the Cesana facility is lost to them, so it reduces their opportunities for pre-season testing at a stroke. In addition to that, they were saying that the Chisana track was closing with their push track facility too, so that's going to hurt them at the start as well, where they don't have that facility to, to push with. You know, a 521 start for Batazzo, not bad, but again, with the, the bad luck he had last year, Achilles problems, hamstrings problems, you know, that's, that could be uh, a good goal for him, just to slowly work his way back up into the top few pushes. Well, yeah, anything that hasn't involved an injury, a crash, or a breakage so far is, is good. That's, that's a bonus. Yeah, you can see how high he was in curve 14 there before he came into the chicanes. Almost hit the top of the lip with the left side of his sled. He's a good driver. He didn't have a great start, but he does have good hands on the D-rings. And uh, Wolfgang Stanford, the driving coach, uh, one of those guys who could find speed on any long track. And hopefully he's imparting some of that. Well, a welcome return at the end of last season in uh, Canada. We saw Chris Spring, whose crew had that big crash earlier on in the year in Germany. And he is back now. And this sled has been rebuilt from the wreckage. The Euro Tech guys insisted on keeping the frame rails. But a brand new singer, Cal, and Spring with Ben Cokewell making his World Cup debut on the back handles of the Canada 2-2 man. Yeah, everybody's glad, glad to see Spring back in the mix. He was one of the nicest guys on tour, and it was uh, pretty devastating to everybody to see that the, the crash that they went through last year, to see him have to miss a few races. But despite all that, he was able to come back and do the America's Cup at the end of last year on this track. So he does have quite a few runs on this track. He had a little bit of a skid out of curve three where you just like to take that tap. He actually went a little bit sideways, costing him a little bit of a time. They started the season as relative unknowns. In fact, they made a joke of it. They had the T-shirts, not Canada 2, Canada who? <laughs> and, and it's that team spirit. And of course, you know, it's the same in, in all the other teams, but it was that team spirit when they were injured. They were all in the hospital together. They flew home together. They're rehabilitating together. If anything, it's made them an even tighter crew than, than without the adversity. So they're really going to be a crew to watch. It's going to second year on the World Cup Tour for spring. Comes in just outside the top 10 in 56.35. Now, listen, right at the top of the show, we're talking about the World Championships and with Russia's Alexander Zubkov. The first heat of the two man World Championships, Zubkov was disqualified. A Russian slider has just been disqualified from the first heat of the World Cup, but it's not Zubkov, it's his teammate Alexander Kazyanov. So, Chris Spring picks up a place as a result. He's 11th. 
But Kazyanov here with Max Belugin, his break man, they are out. And again, it's a weight issue. Jeez, when it, when it rains, it pours for the Russian Federation when they come to Lake Placid. They just can't quite figure out that scale when they come and, and do their practice runs, apparently. When they're in training, you weigh the scabbards that the sled is carried in, you weigh the sled, you weigh the crew, and then you weigh them all together, and then you re-weigh them. And still, you can be in something here that's weighing 1,300 kilos, so 1,600, 1,700 pounds. If you're half a pound out, boy, you are out. I mean, it's very, very far. Yeah, there's a, there's a small window to play with. But again, we talked about, you know, their great equipment, and even if they have great driving, great starts, all that for naught if you can't, uh, yeah, can't, you can't stay can't, within the rules. If you can't count, you can't do anything. Nikita Zakharov, Russia three then. And the second Russian sled now in the field. Let's hope they did their maths correctly on this one. Last year, Nikita, uh, top 20 most of the time. You usually got a second run. But again, with the hire of Pierre Luders, you know, a great driving coach from the Canadian program, you think you think uh, Nikita would be able to, to learn some of these tricks you know, driving some of these tracks, especially this track where Pierre has been down this, this run a number of times. Starting off a 5-3-0 push, he's going to have to learn to drive like an angel because they are not starting fast enough by anybody's stretch of imagination. Was left coming out of the shady curve, tapped before he came into curve 13. See how he shoots the chicane? Oh, Not bad. horrible, but 123.6 uh, speed just isn't going to be competitive. Not too far away from the likes of Edwin van Kalka, who's in that three-way tie in fifth place at the moment. Where does he come in? Have it at the start. So even though he's got a good wind-cheating singer sled, didn't help him. Again, it's like a drag race. If you're up against John Force and he out-accelerates you the moment the lights change, you ain't ever going to catch him, and, and it's very, very similar here. Yeah, the only person he was able to beat was Patrice, who had the 540 start, obviously long way back. And you're just not able to, to gain speed as you go down the track. Puts him into 12th place at the moment, but we're not even halfway through our field. And we are, we're exactly at the halfway point in the field, so there's still a few more that can ease him out of the top 20. And two years out from the games, this is not what the Russians need. They don't need technical slips. They don't need to be chasing the front runners. Ivo De Bruyne makes his first World Cup start of the season. He's made one World Cup debut before. And in the background, coach Nicky Minicello, former women's bobsleigh world champion, retired a couple of seasons ago. She's now in charge of the Dutch program for men and women's bobsleigh, men and women's skeleton, and men and women's luge. Spoke to her yesterday, you got enough on your place in here. I'm learning a lot. I'm excited to see how Evo does on this in this race. You know, he's done, spent a lot of time on the Europa Cup circuit. And he's one of the nicest guys on the on this circuit that you'll ever be able to talk to. So, you know, he works hard, and uh, he's had some great practice runs coming into this. A little skittish coming out of curve two into three, but he's only a tenth back. Yeah, that's due to a great start. Spent the last two years working with Graham Richardson on the Europa Cup program, and Graham rates him very highly indeed. Nice line through Shady. That, that late tap coming into curve 11, very high in 12. That's that's not the fastest line, but hopefully he built enough speed at the top half of the track where that will carry through. 123.9, not awesome, but uh, might keep him in the mix. It's top six at the moment off a third fastest start, drifting away to eighth position. Might end up in the top 10 at the end of his first World Cup heat. He does. 56-22 slide. Nicky Minicello. Not always easy to impress. He's pretty happy with that. He's only one hundredth of a second behind Max Art. Now you'd expect normally to be right in swinging for a podium on that. Yeah, definitely. I would think that uh, you know De Bruyne, Evo. I, I, like I said, I was hoping for a top ten. It's only be a hundredth behind Art. That's uh, that's saying a lot. A lot of it has to do with right here, jumping into the sled, pushing a five eleven. That's a great time. Well, you know what else? Five hundredths of a second behind Edvin van Kalka, who's got so much more experience on the ice. A couple of little errors to tidy up. This is the labyrinth section, curve eleven into twelve, very high on the late part of twelve that caused him to slam down. 
and just lost that little bit of time, and that was that was reflected in the speed coming out of the chicane and at 123.9 kilometers an hour. Well, look, we've had the women's bobsleigh race and the skeleton race as well since training finished for the two-man, so the track is probably even quicker than they expected to find it. Now then, USA 3, Corey Butner with Charles Berkeley behind him. And Corey, again, training really strongly. New sponsor on the US three sled, Waters and Speaks. 516, a, a decent start for them. You know, Chuck Berkeley uh, at the 2010 Olympics. He's a great track and field athlete. Not a great exit of curve two, but not too bad. He makes up for it. He comes straight out of curve three, takes that left hand tap. And just 17 hundredths of a second back so far. So not too bad. He and Nick Cunningham have really been battling the last couple years, as, as well as the last couple weeks. It's kind of almost the toss of a coin who gets USA 2 and USA 3. They're so close. Nick Cunningham third behind Steve Holcomb, the leader at the moment from a seventh best start. He's coming back to fourth place now. So Butner having a really good run. 125 one second quickest only to Steve Holcomb. That's a really good run coming together. Excellent speed for Corey. Wow, we could have three US leads in the top four. We have three US leads in the top five. 100th behind Francesco Friedrich in Germany 3. So it's USA Latvia, USA Germany, USA liking them onions. Yeah, that's, you know, that just goes back to, to say that you know, we spent a lot of time on this track and, you know, we were really excited when the schedule came out to and said that we were going to be on this track first race of the year. Again, that's that exit out of curve two, not real smooth. You want to use that speed that you get from your start, great start time through the first three curves especially. He was just stood out on the dock in front of us watching that error and he just oh, punched his head. Oh, darn it. But look, quicker, top three speeds all from US sleds at the chicane. Attention clear the track. The track is now smooth. Like that Mike Kahn on the left. Yeah, just those two small mistakes out of curve two and, and maybe around curve 12 area. If you could clean those up, definitely be on the podium. Well, USA got a strong program here in North America, so too the Canadians. Three US sleds, three Canadian sleds as well. There's Graham Richardson on the left. New addition to the Canadian setup under coach Tom Delahunty. Justin Cripps has got a brand new break on Jean Nicolas Carrière from Montreal. Cripps, you can tell the Canadians have all been coached by one man, can't you? Pierre Luders was legendary for refusing to go with the visor and sticking with the goggles. The Canadian girls and some of the Canadian guys going with goggles as well. Crips among them. The benefit to that is that they're not going to fog up in the colder weather. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of people will argue that they're just not quite as aerodynamic because your eyes, and obviously you have to point them out toward the, the top of that cowling. And that's one of the, the biggest factors in the aerodynamics. You know, having goggles on doesn't seem to slow too many skiers down, and I'm sure the, the goggle exponents like Lewis would argue if you can see where you're going, that's worth a couple of attempts somewhere, isn't it? Definitely. You know, Cripps Kri has also had quite a few tracks, trips down this track, and he's got a you know pretty decent start time. All he needs to do is, is just breathe as he's going down here, relax. He hasn't had a, a lot of races in here, at least World Cup races. Well, certainly, but he's got the potential. For his brakeman, Jean-Nicolas Carrière, this is the closest track to uh, Quebec. It's only a couple of hours away from Montreal to our north. So this is yeah, really home ice for him. 14th place run for Justin Cripps. He won't be overjoyed with that, but they had a good start. As I was talking about earlier, that tap out of curve three, you want it to be both bunks at the same time. Cripps comes out and, and kind of front taps the, the left side twice and send him into a little bit of a skid. Very high in curve 14 coming into the chicane. A lot of time your coach will say, the less you drive, the better I like it. You see a lot of them trying to let the sled run and just hope it comes the right way back off the wall. Holcomb leads. But behind him, in that gap between first and second, uh, behind him there is a very close battle. From second to tenth, covered by two tenths of a second, and it's just as tight behind. And that means getting into the top ten is going to be very tricky. This is Great Britain's John Jackson. John Baines behind him on the back handles, making a World Cup debut on the GB1 sled. John Jackson going the full Movember route. So him uh, this morning, looks like he should be sliding in a stovepipe hat. He's got such a Victorian uh, face adornment. Yeah, all the British sliders so far have had some kind of a, well, a little bit of a skid coming into curve one, that back end climbed up at the end. Uh, but as I say, all the athletes seem to be sporting some type of facial hair or not. 
November in the English-speaking world. USA, Canada and Great Britain uh, is certainly growing momentum. And it's a great team thing, you know, a lot of the guys, they will all do it. Because, uh, let's face it, none of you Bob said is competitive. You know, there's nothing in having the biggest, bushiest <laughs> moustache or anything, is there? Yeah, we compete with a helmet on, so our looks aren't that big of a factor. Yeah. Apparently. Now, I'm not sure what runners John Jackson has on, but uh, I'm guessing his back end runners might be a little a little fatter, a little wider, because at the top of this track, the back end seemed to be skidding a little bit more than some of the others. And that just means he didn't have the control. You know, a thinner runner would, would follow the front end of the sled just a little bit better. Well, seventh quickest start, comes across the line in 17th place. Pete Gunn on the right, not overjoyed with that. And I don't think Jack will be very happy, because you're right, it did look, did look like the back just didn't really want to follow the front. And that's not a great thing. You know, in addition to that, that skid because of fat runners, that can also happen when an athlete loads into the sled and they come out of those grooves just a little bit late. And you can see coming into curve one, that back end skids up just a little bit. Well, one of the keys to being a brakeman, there's three real things. You've got to heft it away from the block. You've got to load and impart speed. And then you've got to ride it. It's a bit like being the pillion on the back of a motorcycle. What you do does affect what the driver can do. So a rookie maybe just doesn't have the experience of riding as, as still as he needs to. Yeah, and it's a, it's a hard thing to coach. A lot of people say, what do you do when you get into the back of the sled? Uh, and we, we joke that we just need to ride fast. Ah. And how you do that, it's you know sometimes a bit of a question mark. You need to, in a sense, become part of the sled. You don't want to be a real tense ball because then you're going to bounce around in the back of that sled and can cause those little skids as you enter the curves, just like John and John did going into curve one. Czech Republic's Jan Verber with Jan Stoklaska behind him. How many seasons has Stoklaska been breaking bobsleds? It's been around since I've been doing this sport. 5.23 getaway when Verba is really quite a slight guy. I mean, he's, you know, every year he comes back, he's another few kilos heavier, but uh, he did start off uh, as a big monster. Yeah, that's one thing we haven't talked about yet is the weight of the sled. And you want to be as heavy as possible going down the track but you want your sled to be as light as possible while you're pushing. So that difference in weight has to be made up with athlete weight. And so sometimes the, the skinny guys that come in that uh, try to be pilots, you know, it makes it very difficult because they just don't have that, uh, that mass to, to bring the sled down the hill. 23-6, that's decent speed. Czech Republic, and particularly in the hands of Ivo Danilevich, think of the races he's had in San Moritz, either the second or third through the speed traps. 16th place, 56-7-1 between Zakharov of Russia and Savel of Monaco. Jan and Jan, I think they have they have realistic goals. You know, they're probably not going to finish in the top 10 in this race or many of the races this season. But, you know, if they can work their way up and be consistently in the top 20, that'll set them up for, for Sochi. And again, of course, being European-based, they have better knowledge of those European tracks, particularly the German ones, than they do here of North America. So for them, this is, you know, kind of a tougher start to the season. And particularly, I mean, we were talking about this before we went on air. Next week, we go to Salt Lake. It's been a while since the World Cup's race there, a couple of seasons. Well, all the sleds have to max out at 390 kilos, including the crew, and they are contained within that 2.7, 0.67 meter box. A lot of other rules concerning where the axle placements are. Those have changed a little over the winter, and, and particularly things like how wide the cowl, the minimum aperture of the cowl to allow the, the, the men to get in. But uh, they still allowed a, a lot of design freedom, and that's evident in this sled. Jürgen Lewacker with Matthias Adolf. Oh, with a nice matte black wrap. I wonder where they got that idea <laughs> from. Matte black is the fastest, right? Oh, yeah. See, aerodynamicists will tell you they're absolutely right. It's called micro surface boundary layer climate or some such micro uh, boundary layers. Essentially, the matte surface helps trap a tiny little layer of air molecules, which makes it effectively more slippery to the ones that you're going by. Once again, We'd also like to think it's, it's part of the placebo effect as well. If the driver feels good in a matte black sled, that's going to help him drive faster. Absolutely. If your sled looks the business, it makes you feel the business. He's having laid a host on it. That's to be <laughs> yeah. 18th place at the start. 18th place here for Jürgen, Jürgen Lewacker as well. Finding a little bit more pace. Rough exit out of curve 12. That, that shows in his 123.4 kilometer an hour speed right there. 534 getaway is the single biggest nail in the coffin because again Lawaka, like 
Simone Batats of Italy is a talented driver, but when you're running with your shoelaces tied together almost, uh, so to speak, it, it's difficult to really produce that speed. He comes in in 16th, tied with Jan Verber. Yeah, I know Lowacker's a really strong athlete. I've seen him squat, you know, well over 230, 240 kilos. Uh, but you need to, you know, to have a big stride length as well. Everybody's tied up here. We're going to send a mass start yeah. coming down. A lot of power to get the sled moving, but you've got to be able to accelerate it fast as well. You can see Lowacker driving through the heart, curve 17. And we talked about at the beginning that curve little, that curve 18. It's not a not a big curve, but at the same time could cause a lot of problems. Well, there are two guys tied, Jan Verber in the blue, and uh, Jürgen Lowacker in the red, black and white. Tied in 16th position out of 20 sleds that have now come down the hill. 27 field. So we have one more and then our race is full. And after that, it is go fast or go home. So Rico Pater, who has made World Cup starts before, but only a real handful. He's now the number one Swiss driver. Martin Gallica returning to World Cup action for the first time in, I think, three or four years in the number two Swiss sled because of the nation's injury problems among their drivers. Yeah, I was talking with the former Swiss coach earlier today, and he talked about Bauman having a, uh, a bit of a tooth problem, an infection that uh, kept him from coming here to North America. Uh, beat Hefty, you know, last year's World Cup number one ranking, uh, not here as well. So that gives uh, you know Rico Peter an opportunity, as well as Martin Gallica. Difficult. I mean, you think, okay, it's a toothache. You know, it's going to affect you athletically. You don't want to fly with an earache. You really don't want to fly with a toothache. So, yeah, absolutely. You can understand you need to be at home. And also, you know, probably doped up on all sorts of uh, painkillers and antibiotics <laughs> as well. Not exactly ideal for competition. Yep, absolutely. We don't uh, don't encourage drunk driving. No. Maybe the stuff I've been taking for my cold, a lot of the ingredients on the back almost reads like an IOC band list as well. You know, ephedrine, oh, I'll have that, but I know the athletes can't, you know, so there's all that to factor in as well. 124.5, great yeah. speed, wasn't it? Yeah, he shot the chicane very well, straight through there. And again, like Fabian Mayer in the women's race, all these Swiss aerodynamic trick, tick, tricks, tucking his head under the cowling there. It might be worth 100, that might be worth a position could be you know by the time you get to the bottom of the track if you're you know worried about ducking your head sometimes though you know that's uh if you're worried about that you know claiming a spot on the race you might have other things to worry about as well but uh, you know it doesn't hurt well it's all it's it's a routine you know Kathleen Martini has done it all her career Enrico Peter obviously decides that it's worthwhile as well and yeah it might work he's 200s in front of the sled behind him 300s behind the one in front so he's in a tight battle yeah that might have made the difference you can see it right here disappears can't see a thing but Wait. hopefully that uh, that difference in aerodynamics makes up for it absolutely right so rico pater completes our 20 and the man on the bubble is great britain's john jackson if anybody goes quicker than him then he will be out and watching the second heat 56 9 2 is the time now for the remaining six sleds to all try and beat Milan Janišák of Slovakia with Martin Tezovic behind him. Janišák, the ultimate enthusiast. As you can see, not a man in the first flush of athletic youth, but he funds this program because he loves bobsledding. 5.58 start time. You know, that's the, the slowest we've seen so far, but, you know, we have to have to acknowledge Martin Tezovic in the back of the sled. Uh, I think he went to the London Olympics as a weightlifter. Very strong athlete. Uh, I've seen him clean well over 180 uh, kilos as well. I wonder if the people that watched London 2012 most were bobsled coaches, because there seems to have been a lot of, I mean, immediate plundering of, of the athletic ranks from the, from the summer games. Immediately, oh, we'll have him, we'll have her, we'll have them. Yeah, it's great for bobsled recruiting. You go after weightlifters, you go after track and field athletes. Uh, in the USA, you know, we like to go after football players. This as well, NFL, CFL, college football players, if you pop up on the radar, there might be an even colder, even nastier game for you to play than to be a, a, a defensive lineman. 57-45 slide for Milan Janáček. So John Jackson breathes a little easier. Janáček comes in 21st place, does not make the race. You just can't have high expectations when you have a start time like that. Well, you know, he 
he understands he's not going to win races, but he's coming to enjoy driving and not just to be right at the tail of the field. There's as fierce a harder competitor inside him, perhaps, as anybody else out there, because he's given away 20 years, perhaps, to the other older drivers. So he's got a lot on his plate. That's true. He's been here a number of times, but really struggled through that labyrinth part. Curve 11, he was on the left side of the track where you want to be on the right side. Curve 12, he was really high on the exit. Curve 14, he might have even touched the, the top of the lip as he came into the chicane. Well, here we have a World Cup debutante, Loic Coster from France and Romain Einrich, his brake man. Neither have raced in the World Cup before. And again, an indication of uh, the French trying to find a program to put together. Bruno Mijon's glory days for France in the late 1990s, long since departed. In fact, for many years, the French program ground to an absolute halt. But Kosteg, perhaps the first spark of a new era. A young, really enthusiastic guy, very keen. I mean, he was just so thrilled to be here in Lake Placid when I spoke to him earlier in the week. 5-3-0 getaway. Now, if you're building a program and kind of starting from scratch, the best way to do it is to get great athletes. Now get off to a fast start, and then you can develop the bobsled driving skill. You know, 530 is just not a, a real competitive start time at that first 50 meters. As you say, absolutely right. If you can start, and any coach would love to have a great fast team and then teach them how to crash less often, it's, it's difficult the other way around. It takes longer the other way around, perversely, to get speed out of the athlete's legs than it does out of their brain. Yeah, it's easier to, to make an athlete a bobsledder than to make a bobsledder an athlete. I like it, that. Who <laughs> is that. Is that one of Scheibers? That's a very good phrase. 123.7, not bad speed, mind you. So whatever vintage the kit is, put it through the chicane nicely. 16th place, makes the cut in his first ever World Cup appearance. And John Jackson of Great Britain is out of the race. Patrice Savelle now is the man who's hanging by a thread in 20th place. Well, bienvenue. Welcome, young Monsieur Kosterg. You have made the cut in your first ever World Cup race on a track you've never raced on before, so that's impressive. That is something to be proud of. He's a little low going through the, the belly of, of Shady 2. That set him up into curve 11, not too bad, and sets him into curve 12. Again, a little high at the end, but not too bad, really. Wow, interesting stuff. Lots of kids down here. Lots of uh, ice hockey players in town. And here we go with the Korean. This is Yun Jung Won and Junglin Yun behind him. Now, uh, two Korean sleds made their World Cup debut in Vancouver at the end of last season. And Yung Jun here was the four-man driver. But it looks like now that he was going to be the spearhead of Korea's two- and four-man World Cup program. And it's the first time we've had, well, I don't know if it is going to be a full World Cup career, but it's the first time the season has started with the Korean sled in the World Cup. Yeah, the Korean program is kind of an, an, in an interesting situation right now. They're the host of the 2018 Olympics. So, you know, they're starting to build this program, and they want to, you know, give a good showing on their home track in 2018. So they're looking you know, a ways into the future and really starting to develop drivers, starting to get these good athletes in. You know, the earlier they can get them World Cup experience, the better. Of course, all their driving so far has been on North American tracks. You are the, the biggest landmass with tracks compared to where they start off in Korea. And actually, 524, not a bad start. He's got some good lines here. Yeah, that looks really looks really smooth. Uh, coming out, Chicane's pretty straight through there. He's in the race at the moment, 18th place. A good heart. He's 20th. He's pushing out uh, Patrice Savelle of Monaco. Does he hang on? He does. Pushes out Savelle. Oh, he's tied. So we have 21 sleds in a 20 sled race. 56, 8, 9 slides. Tied with Patrice Savelle of Monaco. And again, for a young driver, up against somebody like Patrice that's got lots more experience of ice, full stop. That's a good effort. Yeah, with this program, you're looking for the, the baby steps, you know, just really trying to slowly get things together. We know for a lot of the young nations, for younger and smaller nations, making the cut is a big, significant step. Yeah, and he has to be proud of just that chicane right there. You know, very few drivers have, have been able to shoot that chicane straight. You know, none of the Germans did. Holcomb uh, was able to. But uh, for the most part, you know, that one little section, he was able to, to match the best in the world. Well, his World Cup debut in four-man was at Whistler, in two-man at Lake Placid. What's next? Altenburg for his second race. You know, they're not breaking him in easily. Well, it's a long time since I've said the words Martin Gallagher 
except for I wonder whatever happened to Gallagher back in the Swiss World Cup lineup and Abraham Morlu behind him again a name I don't think I've ever seen on a World Cup entry list Gallagher has got World Cup experience he's got a lot of Europa Cup experience as well Start from Martin Gallica, 525. He's putting together a pretty decent run so far. No, uh, no major mistakes, nice and high through curve shady too. Martin Gallica of Switzerland, our 25th starter of 27. He's 16th at the moment, of only the 19th fastest start, but ooh, a horrible slide. Good speed though from the Swiss leg, 124.5. That is an elderly Hildebrand sled, unless I miss my guess. That is not one of the high-tech new city of sleds. That's got a proper old-fashioned Hans Hildebrand look. He's in the race, 56.59, and he pushes out two sleds, both uh, Patrice Savella Monaco and Yun Jung Won of Korea. Well. Tied at number six. Thank you very much. Well, welcome back to Lake Placid. Those of you who are just joining us on the Universal Sports Network, you can see a lot of Korean faces down there in the crowd. They have just seen the Korean sled go into a tie for 20th and be bumped out as the uh, Swiss come in 20th place. Steve Holcomb leads the first heat here. And he leads by a sizable margin, but right behind him is an almighty tussle from second down to 12th place, less than three tenths of a second, covering the bulk of the field at the moment. We've got two sleds remaining in our first heat of 27 sleds, and then the fast 20 go into the second deciding heat. This is Michel Cerise 